Hello and welcome to another episode. On this one, we've got a very special podcast for you today. We've got Unix guy here on the channel. For those of you who don't know, he's big in the cybersecurity community on YouTube, has been publishing videos for quite a few years and has done some amazing things. So yeah, how are you today? How are you doing? Hey Salah, yeah, I'm really good. Really excited to be here. Been meaning to do this one for you for a while. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. So yeah, I guess if you could give us a little bit of background, what is it that you do and how did you get into cybersecurity and your kind of own personal journey? Yeah, look, absolutely. So at the moment, I mean, we can walk backwards, but at the moment I work in consulting. So I work in one of the consulting firms where I help organizations with their cybersecurity problems. Usually maybe it could be strategy or let's say identity and access management or incident response, whatever it is, we do it. I mean, by we, I mean myself and the team. Yeah. So really helping different organizations with cybersecurity problems. So I really do consulting. I don't do a lot of hands-on work at the moment, but I used to. Prior to that, I did some digital forensics and incident response and network security. But really, it all started with, like, as the name says, Unix guy. I was working uh, as a sort of Unix security and engineer long time ago. When I started, there wasn't really dedicated cybersecurity roles. So you were either a network engineer who did some firewalls or, in my case, a Unix engineer where like security at the time was just, I remember we have a Sun microsystem server and Checkpoint, which is a firewall company now, used to be just a software that we installed it on a server and that was security. So yeah, humble starts. We didn't have tools or anything, but yeah, that's how we started. And here we are. Yeah, oh, that's really cool. Really interesting. What made you want to get started in cybersecurity? What was the kind of, I guess, the thing that motivated you and gave you that direction to start your career off in Unix? Yeah, look, to, to be honest, it's a very, very long story. I mean, I don't know how much time you have, but uh, I don't know if you uh, remember or you're too young for it, but there used to be a chatting, uh, internet chatting platform called uh, IRC or MIRC. It used to be this chat service, that just really text-based when the internet started. And yeah, look through there. I was in school and I discovered that you can download music and you can um, do a lot of and download movies and do lots of things. But um, yeah, it was really common and slash easy to steal someone's passwords or someone's username. So I got curious and I remember if I asked any question, people used to literally shout at you and make fun of you, call you a noob. And um, yeah, there wasn't that friendliness that exists today. Uh, but one comment, they said, you need to learn Unix. You need to learn Linux before you can even, you know, be allowed to, to ask what they call them stupid questions. So yeah, there was an internet forum, still exists to this day, it's unix.com. So in unix.com, it's really just an internet forum where people ask questions and learn. So I went there, I started learning, and as I was learning, I started to help others uh, with their like Unix problems. That's when I got my job as a Unix uh, engineer, and from there I started learning. Like I said, there wasn't really training courses or anything. There was like some quote-unquote really silly hacking tools that you can use. Some keyloggers, so keyloggers is really a software you install where if someone types something, you just log the keys that, that they type, so that's quote-unquote stealing password at the time. Yeah, some ancient tools like Sub7 and other ridiculous tools that I learned and that was really the start. But yeah, it all started with, you know, chat rooms and just people saying, you need to do this, you need to do that. Similar to what we have today. But yeah, the only difference is we didn't have training courses. So there was no such thing as a training course where you go and learn how to hack. It was something that you earned. <laughs> Oh, wow. It's a very different world back then. And I remember speaking to a senior guy who'd been in the industry for probably 40, 50 years. And I showed him the poor Jeremy certification roadmap and said, look, there's 400 plus cybersecurity certification. And he was just so confused and shocked because nothing existed when he started. And when he started, there was yeah. no or more training, you just kind of had to figure it out through kind of research and reading, which is uh, different to what you have today. And if you'll help me, because you mentioned that awful, hideous paper that Paul Jeremy's, uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I still see it floating to this day. I think that picture of like, I think Paul was trying to help and he just put every certification he could find in this gigantic photo and it did more damage than good because like you said even someone with 40 years of experience found it confusing because it is that certifications roadmap is extremely i would say outdated unnecessary and factually wrong in my opinion uh, i've seen it floating around i'm, I'm but still funny that it still floats around i've seen it a long time ago and some four and it <laughs> died 
it definitely hasn't died. No one needs to do all of those certifications. This is one too. I can never even like zoom out and read it properly. So half of these certifications just look like brown small boxes. But yeah, learn to scare people. Like if you want to work in security, here you go. Do all of it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. A good weapon to put people off the industry. Fair enough. So in terms of certifications, what would you think is the ideal kind of starting point? I know there's so many different areas in cybersecurity and I guess it might depend on what you wanted to do, but let's say there was someone who wanted to get like a broad overview of the industry and understand the different domains or areas. What particular certification would you say that's the one to do, that's the one to go for? It really is a difficult question, Salah, because I'm not a huge fan of the world, like the perfect or the ideal or the optimal, because as you're aware, there is so many ways to get into cybersecurity or to learn it. And plus, you'll find that different individuals tend to learn in a different manner. So someone might enjoy something a bit more hands-on, others would like to read a book or listen. So I think that complicates the issue. Add to that is in the industry itself, I found is that the majority of cybersecurity professionals don't have any certifications. So they are popular. Certifications are popular when someone's trying to land or get into cybersecurity, but once you're in the field, there are so, so many people who've never done a single certification and they're doing well. Now, having said that, I'm not saying certifications are not good. The way I treat them as a great way or a structured way to learn a subject. So if I wanted to learn penetration testing, for example, I have roadmaps on my YouTube channel where I give you, you know, a sequence of things you need to do to learn that subject. I think this is a great way to learn. It gives you that structure so you're not doing random things or you're not spinning your wheels. Now, if we're talking about extremely broad introduction, someone who's never touched a computer before or don't know what cybersecurity is, I'm a fan of the Google cybersecurity certificate for a couple of reasons. I think Google has done a good job in making it engaging and interesting. So if someone is just starting out you get a quick sense of progress so you find that you're finishing those modules they'll give you a small chance to even practice some of the things that you learn so you get to see what a linux command line is what a python is it's not going to make you an expert but i think it just introduces you to everything it may not necessarily lead to a job but it's a starting point where at least you know what cyber security is and like i said again there are so many people who will get their first cyber security job with absolutely zero certifications that definitely happen but yeah Google Cyber Security Search, some people like to recommend CompTIA Security Plus. I think it's helpful, but again, I'm not a huge fan of multiple choice based exams or questions because I don't think it's a great way to test you on a subject. Just test how well you memorize things. And yeah, very much I prefer hands-on stuff. So any chance you get to do anything hands-on and practical, go for it. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's some really good advice. Essentially trying to focus on the skills you gain from certifications as opposed to the title itself and also trying to do something a bit more hands-on, a bit more practical and maybe kind of ignore some of the gleam and aura around some certifications because yeah, it's not all cracked up to be. It is just a certificate at the end of the day at times. So it's funny you mentioned the aura around some certifications. This aura in my view or my observation seemed to exist exclusively on the internet and especially on people who are just starting or sort of trying to formulate an idea like in the real world, in the industry, I have yet to see someone says, I want to hire you because you have this certification. I mean, there are exceptions, for example, highly technical certifications. Like when I worked in digital forensics, there was a SANS GCFA. The tools that you learn in that certification are used in the job. So it was kind of a proof that you've used these tools and you're tested. So it was kind of something that proved that you've got that particular skill or OSCP for offensive security security like penetration testing it proves that you know some of the hands on work but other than that i think the confusion starts when someone does a job search they see the name of the certification they quickly assume that this certification will land to that job it's most probably what's happened is just people copy paste those job descriptions and they just post the job they don't really care uh, like i said i've yet to have someone ask me what certifications i have or what i've done with them it's just the word aura or yeah this mystery around certain certifications seem to exist if you're trying to break into the field but once you do that i'm curious to hear your experience of if like let's say your boss cares if, if you had a certification or if they ask you what certifications to do or like I'm curious to hear from you on that yeah I mean with me personally I think you are right you get to a certain level and 
they mean nothing. It's experience. It trumps it. So we've worked with quite a lot of people, senior managers, you know, they've had the senior, the SISM, the SISPs, the OSCPs, and other certifications, and they've just let them lapse. They've just ignored them. They've not updated them because after 10 or 15 years, it becomes irrelevant. Your experience carries you through. But I think at the entry level, you do tend to get asked for certifications. I wouldn't say it's a mandatory requirement, but I think you have two options of showing your skills. One, through certification, I've studied these domains, I've passed or I have knowledge in these areas, or through showing your work publicly. So people doing it through blogs, through YouTube, through whatever means they want to do, you know, GitHub projects, everything else, essentially showing your skills, showing what you're capable of. And I think certifications are just that in essence, it's saying I've studied this, I've learned this, I'm able to do this. And you can do that without certifying, but definitely early on, if you're in the first few years of your career, they might be more requested more important but i think after about 10 years they just become completely irrelevant and your experience carries you through that's kind of my thoughts on it in my opinion no 100 percent, really good points and like you said they're an excellent way to to learn something and showcase something so yeah even if someone is working and they've got five years of experience and if they want to learn a new topic if they want to get deeper in one area the options as you know you do a training course or you do some projects in that area or you just simply study like after work to gain those yeah yeah no definitely definitely it's interesting while we're on certifications i'm not sure if you'd call the course you released a certification but you've just released a grc mastery i had a look at it the other day and it looked really good in terms of the content in there i don't think there's a lot of things similar to it on the market i think there's definitely a big gap in the market for grc specific training or courses could you tell us a little bit about that the kind of thought process behind that what made you do it and yeah what it's like Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So look, well, I guess the problem started about a year ago. I was creating videos for like creating just roadmaps for individuals who want to land their first cybersecurity job. So I created roadmaps. If you want to be, you know, a cyber analyst doing incident response or detection, I have one for digital forensics, one for engineering, one for penetration tester. The only issue was GRC, which is a huge area on its own. Like even under GRC, there are many, many subspecializations. And I found that there is problem number one is there are no trainings in the field. So as far as certifications, for example, for GRC jobs, usually we will list, because that's the area I work in at the moment, we will list optional certification that you might have like ISACA, CISA or CISM or CIRIS or even like CISSP. Those certifications are good, but there's a couple of problems with them. What I found is those certifications test you on GRC as opposed to teach you GRC. I think that's the first problem. The second problem is they want you to have five years of experience in the field before you attempt doing them. But not only that, I found that even that experience is quote unquote uh, questionable. Like you can have experience in any domain and it can, you know, loosely translate to experience in cyber, which is not the case. So this is problem number one. So there were certifications that are multiple choice based that test you on the subject. They don't teach you the subject. And I also like I know individuals who just memorize and cram their ways into passing them. That's not everyone. You can study and learn and understand the material and pass. But again, I found the limitation of the thinking again shift into how do I pass a multiple choice exam that's not the real world the real world is not multiple choice this is issue number one issue number two I found there are extremely extremely overpriced training courses like $20,000 or $18,000 or $15,000 for a training course that claims to teach you GRC and I've even had a chance to look into some of these courses I found some of them are like an AI voice reading from a slide or I found it's just someone going through a spreadsheet of every control and just blabbing and that is not the way to teach it so again i found a big gap in the market so i wanted to create something that is suitable for someone with zero experience but it will also teach them the necessary skills to do grc and again the other problem i faced as i was creating the course is i can't teach someone to do let's say cyber security risk assessment to an application before i explain to them you know okay you're assessing the risk of an application you need to look at identity and access management you need to look, look at vulnerability so i found that well i can't jump to risk management without explaining everything else to you so i'm like okay i'm gonna chop it down into different modules and and you'll have a module on identity and access management. You'll have a module on asset management. You'll have a module on vulnerability. So I didn't leave a stone unturned. And again, that created another challenge is I didn't want the course to be extremely long. So I'm like, okay, 
I need to summarize it as much as possible. So if you get a chance to do the course, you'll find that it's literally the summary of experience. These are the areas in identity and access management, and here's what you need, but then here's the problems that you'll see in the real world. And this is where most companies fail in this area. Because I've seen common themes in different organizations. When you work in consulting, you get to work on many organizations and you'll find there is usually a pattern where organizations fail. So I've added that and then I added practical assessment at the end of each module. But then at the end, I created a capstone project. So the capstone project, you need to assess the entire cybersecurity program for an organization, and then you need to give them recommendation to fix it. It's a fairly quote unquote senior task, but I've simplified it in the capstone. You will be using the NIST cybersecurity framework, and then I'll show you how to interpret those results. Now, the issue I think was, again, the misconceptions are with quote unquote the available GRC training courses that they're like, this is a PCI DSS course, or this is an ISO course. Well, in my course, I teach you how to read a framework. So if you can do it using NIST, you can do it using any framework, meaning you get the skills of now you're a GRC professional, you can read a framework, you can interpret a framework. So that's really my thinking on my rationale, Salah, is I wanted something practical, I wanted something applicable for beginners, but also no matter how many years of experience you have, you will learn something from it because I've summarized lots of hands-on experience in it, a lot. So there is something for everyone. It's short that someone can finish it quickly and I also price it what I believe is appropriately. So it's not overpriced. In fact, I think it's way low price for the value, but I wanted it to be accessible to everyone around the world. With caveats, you'll always get some individuals who find it a bit expensive and that's understandable, but I want it to be fair to everyone. So yeah, that really is the rationale, Salah. I wanted to fix a gap in the market and I wanted it to be something that, yeah, will really make GRC accessible to everyone. There is a need in the market for GRC professional. Cybersecurity is not just hacking and incident response and socks. There is GRC, we need that. But at the moment, it's, you know, luck of the draw. If you finish your uni degree or if you happen to land a job in one of the big consulting firms, then you will learn GRC. Otherwise, it's just messy. <laughs> I talked for a long time, but that's really the gist of my thinking and why I did what I did. No, it makes a lot of sense. And to be honest, I think you touched on like, some amazing points where training, I mean, I've done like CSO and some multiple choice and CISP and uh, you are right. I mean, you learn a lot of theory, it's multiple choice, but in the real world, there's no kind of practical application to it. You know, there's a lot of times where you have to go back and Google stuff and ask for senior mentorship. And essentially, that's what you've done. You've took your experience, created a course that's relevant and useful for people that, in my opinion, gives you more relevant skills than one of the multiple choice courses might do. And the way you've structured it as well by touching on all those kind of core struggles, those core elements that you see in consulting, that you see in cybersecurity in general, is just going to prepare people, just give them an idea of what they're going to have to be dealing with. Because one of the things that I struggled with the most personally, for example, is that the training or the reading that you do in some of these multiple choice, you're doing stuff at such a high complex level. And then you're learning all these deep topics about cybersecurity. And then you touch the real world of consulting and stuff like that. And you're literally the biggest issue is like access management and identity and access or it's going to be like implementing MFA or some other form of like secure authentication, changing password policies. You work with a basic kind of sys control, some of the NIST controls, and it's more repetitive implementation and communication of those than it is anything as complex as you tend to learn. So I think it's uh, highly recommended and Sounds like an amazing course, to be honest. Yeah, thanks, Salah. And even like it's really good observation. You, you were able to observe that, you know, we learn about hacking and all of that, but then the company have a poor password policy. I think it gets also a lot more complicated at a higher level. So let's say my client will be a CIO and he's like, he will show me and he'll have a coffee with me. And I'm like, okay, so I've invested in this, you know, latest AI. I've got the dark trace. I've got Splunk. I'm like, great. Okay. So I go there and I'm like, what's your asset management's like? Asset management is like, oh, Oh, well, I've got this tool that scans the environment. Oh, fantastic. How much coverage do you have? And once you scan, do you understand what you're scanning? If I spend a couple of weeks on that client, I will 
most probably find that they have quote unquote outdated servers or asset laying there down there. No one knows what they're doing and that's like the biggest risk. Or I'll find they don't have a proper process to offboard some of the machine. And this is how companies get compromised. They'll have something laying there that no one knows about it. While the security operation center is busy with the latest and greatest tools, which is important. Cybersecurity incidents are important, but then they'd have this huge area that no one looks at. So it gives you that level of, okay, so I need to be looking at these things as a cybersecurity professional. Not only that, let's say you're doing incident response, that you will be dealing with auditors. And as they come, well, you kind of don't know what are they doing? What are they wasting my time? So all of this is in the course. Again, I think it gives people, even if someone is technical, it gives them perspective on, oh, okay, so this is why we do what we do. Or this is why my manager didn't invest in this latest and greatest tool because investment need to go to other areas that are higher priority, for example. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, 100%. A great structure and includes very relevant real-world problems that are kind of missing out of a lot of certifications. So if anyone's watching and you want to learn more about GRC, definitely check that out. Another question for you, I guess, is so working in Australia is where you're based now. If that's okay, do kind of share that with everyone. Held in Australia, and I've revealed my identity too, so there's no secret. <laughs> no worries. What's the kind of regulatory cybersecurity landscape like over there? Because I'm pretty sure it's very different to the UK, where I'm from, or maybe America and Canada. I mean, each country, each state in some cases, you know, have their own privacy laws, they have their own regulations they like to see. Like with America, for example, they like the SOC 2, SOC 1, SOC 3 type reports. In the UK, they're not very popular. You tend to go for the ISOs, but then they have their own GDPR and other things. But essentially, what's the landscape like in Australia? And if you can maybe talk a little bit on the problem of the world just being under so many different conflicting at times and regulations that just don't make too much sense. Yeah. Yeah, look, really good question, Sada. So usually you'll find that Australian market is a few years behind Europe and the US. So we're a little bit slower to adopt some of these uh, frameworks. I think the first thing that we need to look at is privacy. So because those tend to enforce a lot of the other cybersecurity frameworks, for example, privacy may not be technically a cybersecurity issue. I mean, it, it is and it isn't, but it's more of a legal issue first, but lots of privacy controls end up being cybersecurity controls. So as you said earlier in Europe, the GDPR was the strongest privacy law that we've seen in recent years. And we've seen cases where there are millions of dollars worth of fines as a result of breaching GDPR. So I think Europe is leading the way. The US, there is, a, I guess, a similar and trying to be equally powerful regulation is the California Privacy Act. So that's just for the state of California. I think Californians tend to lead the way when it comes to these things. Uh, in Australia, we have the Privacy Act or the Australian Privacy Act, we refer to it as the Privacy Act. It's uh, a gentler version of, of the GDPR, definitely not as enforced as GDPR. However, you will find that Australian businesses, um, like for example, for the GDPR, if any of your clients are citizens of the European Union, or if you do any business in Europe, which a lot of Australian businesses do, you actually need to comply with the GDPR. So that has enforced, that has led to a lot of uplift in cybersecurity. I don't think Australian companies are where they need to be when it comes to cybersecurity, but that has started the conversation. Now, as far as framework. So again, it depends on the industry. Uh, we do have a popular framework that's being adopted worldwide. It's called the ASD Essential 8. ASD is the Australian Signals Directorate. It's like the NSA in the US. Um, it's that sort of agency that's meant to enforce security locally. So that tends to be a framework that's really simple, like, you know, eight recommendations, enable two-factor authentication, update your servers, etc., etc. Even that proven to be difficult to implement for some organizations. Uh, so that's a popular framework. As far as the financial services, these tend to be more regulated than others. They also tend to have more money than others so they can invest. So there is the popular PCI DSS, which is just a standard for credit cards enforced worldwide. But we also have our own called CPS234 that has created a storm in Australia. Basically, CPS234 is a framework where APRA is the regulator for financial services. That If you're a financial institution, you need to do this kind of quote unquote, bare minimum of security controls in place. And that has kept us busy for years. So that's really is the case in Australia. As far as like, you know, ISO, NIST, all of those, those, all those frameworks are exactly the same. They talk about the same thing. 
just different naming conventions for different things. So I've, I've seen them worldwide. I've seen them in the US, Europe, different parts of Europe and the UK. So in that regard, I don't think there is a difference. But yeah, generally speaking, you'll find that, yeah, Australia is a little bit late to the party when it comes to some of those things. It's a little bit more relaxed when it comes to security. Yeah, yeah. No, fair enough. But I think you touched on a good point there where you said that generally ISO based, et cetera, they're all the same thing. And I think it's uh, it's quite an interesting skill to have, which kind of is part of your course as well. But when you've maybe implemented or audited, you know, the ins and outs of a full ISO implementation or NIST or, you know, any of these popular frameworks, you generally tend to understand how much overlap there is between them and it becomes so much easier to pick something up and just interpret the document and be able to do it so that's kind of a key skill to have you know of course they have minor differences between them but generally they're all the same and but encryption is encryption complex password is complex password whether it's part of the cis 25 or i don't know the isos or the nist or the pci dss the if you understand cybersecurity, those frameworks are just a structured way for you to map what you have to the framework. No more, no less. So I think people get too hung up of, do I need ISO skills or do I need a skill? As a cybersecurity professional, you have to be able to read and interpret and understand the control. It's written in an easy way for you to understand. Yeah. 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 So that definitely. What would you say are, uh, if you can share some tips and guidance on people's kind of professional profile and a little bit about networking, should somebody start a blog, a YouTube channel, or LinkedIn, you know, what are some best practices? I guess you're hiring people, you're looking at people, you're involved in the interview process. What do you look for? What things make people stand out to you? One, when they are, I guess, just cold and you're just reading their CVs, their LinkedIn, and two, when you speak to them. Yeah, look, really, really good point. And I think it's a multidimensional question, but I'll start from the beginning. There is really two ways of getting a job, right? You either apply or someone reach out to you and offer you a job. So if you're starting out, it's unlikely that someone will reach out to you and offer you a job just because people don't know you yet. As you get more and more skills, you will be approached. You can't afford not to apply to cybersecurity jobs. I found candidates unanimously make this mistake of they'll just apply to one job and wait and hope for the best. And if they get a rejection, they get upset which I totally understand. But if you want to land a cybersecurity job, it sounds silly to say you need to apply to a lot of cybersecurity jobs. You need to do it frequently. You need to play the numbers game. So for me, from what I see, the first thing is I need to see your CV as part of a job application. There are job openings out there with 10 applicants or five applicants and sometimes zero applicants. And this drives me crazy. Like as someone who is new, you need to apply to those jobs. That's that number one, I think. Number two is looking at the job application and thinking that you need to meet each and every criteria. That's not true. I've never, I've never ever landed the job where I met or everything they have. If you find that you have, you know, 30%, 40%, whatever, like, you know, something about the job, go for it. I'm not saying apply to a senior director of a security job if you're still fresh, but if it's asking for some skills that you've learned as part of your certifications or your course, apply. Uh, you will generally find that the hiring manager is someone who have probably done this job before they will be fully aware that you knew you're not trying to trick them here yeah. but you know you can show your enthusiasm you can show that you're willing to learn really important show that you you know you can work well with others you don't have a massive ego these are the things that will land you a job so just put yourself out there be in front of companies front right and center apply to jobs that is like the 99 percent of what you need to do i in my opinion everything else is like the one percent sure if you want to create youtube videos which i don't know why you would want to do that because it takes a lot of time and effort, as you've seen, Salah. Uh, <laughs> you can do that, but in my opinion, as someone who's new to the field, you're better off spending your time growing your cybersecurity skills because that will take a lot of time. Same thing with YouTube is a skill on its own. So if you want to learn that, that's fantastic, but that's probably will not translate to cybersecurity directly. If you want to start a blog or LinkedIn, all of these are good. I think having a good LinkedIn profile, it's great. People can look you up. They can see what you've done. This is always good. I think everything else is extra. I think the important thing is, as you've mentioned, Saleh, is also cybersecurity events. I think it's really underrated. As someone who's trying to land their first cybersecurity job, make it a point to show up to cybersecurity events. Meetups. If you go to meetup.com, there's probably some kind of a free meetup in your area. Just go. It doesn't necessarily need to, you know, not every meetup will lead 
you don't actually do a job, but at least you get to listen to what people have to say, chat with individuals who work in the industry and ask, ask them if they have an internship or show them that you're interested. This might lead to a job. This will not be a substitute to you applying to jobs, but I think it's something you can do in your free time if you're dedicated to really landing your first cybersecurity job. But yeah, like blog, LinkedIn, videos, YouTube, TikTok, whichever you feel comfortable doing, all of these things are fine, but still you need to have that job application ready to go as you start and learn and study and grow your skills. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think applying for jobs is the number one priority and you're going to get rejected quite a lot. And that's just something people are going to have to face. And as you go through your career, as you, depending on your life experiences, some people are more used to rejection. Some people might take it more personally, but it's definitely something where you have to grow a thick skin and just be able to move on, learn, ask for feedback and just, yeah, keep applying, keep trying to, I guess. hundred percent. And sorry, and I've had interviews, I got rejected and, you know, sometimes it's reasonable, sometimes it's not. Like it doesn't, I remember interviewing for an organization and I got to like a three interview. So first one, great, then technical, none of them I think were really technical, but like I got to the final stage where I'm just meeting, I think it was the CIO. Yeah, everything is great. And yeah, two weeks later, rejection, it happens. And I saw that they hired someone else who had less experience than me. It happens, like they don't, owe me a job and yeah it sucks you might get upset especially if you get invested in it and you really wanted it but things happen sometimes they want someone else sometimes both candidates are good you just need to pick one so no matter who you pick the other person might get upset you know both of them can do the job so like just because you have the skills and you're a great candidate which you probably are doesn't mean that the job needs to go to you it will go to someone so like you said thick skin but even if you know you get upset a little bit um, it's fine <laughs> I mean, you move on, you get something else. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. What do you think about the current cybersecurity or, and why the tech market? Because, you know, you're seeing a lot of layoffs, you're seeing a lot of insecurity. Do you think that should be something to put people off the industry and maybe reconsider? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that's just kind of a minor fluctuation in the market and it will readjust? Yeah, look, really good point. I'm actually thinking of creating a dedicated video on this. My problem is the video will probably be satire, which I don't want to do. <laughs> Promise myself not to do these things anymore. But look, here's the issue, right? In 2008, like, I don't know if you remember, 2008, there was a global financial crisis. The world yeah. is crashing. Everyone's crashing. People losing their jobs. People getting kicked out of their houses. Doom and gloom. It's judgment day. That's 2008. Between 2008 and what we're 2024, every single year, people were talking about a recession, about layoffs. Basically, there is always every single year for as long as I remember, there was doom and gloom and it's judgment day and everything is going bad. Okay. Now, even before that, in the 90s, there was the dot-com bubble. You know, lots of people invested in so many internet companies. Lots of them got passed. Lots of good tech people were in the market. They got laid off, and including like companies like Amazon, where people were making fun of Amazon.com because it wasn't profitable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And people thought the internet's going to go anywhere. And here we are. Again, between 1990s and today, every single year was, this is the year where the world is going to end. It's the end of the year. It's in the Mayan calendar. It's, you know, everything will end. There's no point. Uh, anything done. Ah, uh, you know, companies will never hire. Uh, everyone even when i was starting I remember there was this rule for like all jobs would say especially for unix jobs you have to have five years of experience you can't get hired without five years of experience right so it was always like none of this is new is what i'm trying to say is none of this is new this is point number one right every single year there's something i think people forget even like 2020 when that thing that we don't want to mention happened <laughs> you know it was ending the world was ending yeah. there was videos of people like falling on the video yeah. i I remember, people forget, I remember, everything was crashing, the stock market crash, everything's crashing, right? Companies were firing people, people losing their jobs. I'm not saying those things didn't happen, they did happen, right? But here we are, we survived. I think this is important to remember, to keep things in perspective, right? Every single year, there will be someone saying, this is it, this is the end of the world. I call them doomsday sayers, right? There are always people who are chasing that doomsday. Even there's movies, I think we as species, as humans, we love the apocalypse type thing. Like those movies always do well. We love that. I don't know why, I think it's ingrained. <laughs> Uh, we, we just love, you know, the world is ending and, you know, I think it's a lot less stressful to think that, you know, the world is ending. I need, don't need to worry about the problems that I'm running away from, right? You know, the economy is crashing. All right, I don't need to fix this health issue that I have or this financial issue that I have. It's a type of escapism. Anyway, I've gone too deep. Let's go back to reality. I think this is point number one. Number two, in 2008, when the global financial crisis hit, None of the experts, like the, the Harvard professors, the economists, ever, 
Nobody predicted that. This is really important and people forgot that. None of the financial experts saw this coming. Maybe one or two said something and there's movies about them. But the reality is the vast majority of people who work in finance, who are experts in finance, saw the global financial crisis coming. There are people who are saying, you know, everything's going to crash every year, fantastic. But no one knew that 2008, it will happen that way. So this is another important point to keep in mind that even the experts don't know or didn't predict that financial global financial crisis is about to happen. Same thing today. So none of the experts predicted that there will be lays off. It just didn't happen. It's easy to talk about something after 10 o'clock. Like, oh yeah, it made sense, you know, that layoffs happens because X, Y, Z, therefore this needed to happen. Fantastic. Why didn't you predict that if you knew it? So I think point number two is really important. Even the expert can't predict what's about to happen. So if someone tells you in two years time, this and this happen, mm, sorry, you don't know what's going to happen. Experts can't predict anything, especially when it comes to, you know, those doom and gloom things like, a great example was AI. I remember I had a project, I think in 2000, I can't remember the year when I was in uni. No, even before, maybe 2004, I can't remember. I had a uni subject where I did a machine learning project on neural networks, which is really similar to like the AI now. So AI wasn't a new topic, yet no one predicted that OpenAI would release ChatGPT, which will change the world forever. There has always been AI research and it's not a new buzzword. But no one saw that coming and that has changed things. So again, lots of events happen that we simply can't predict. Okay. So I think that's really important to, to keep in mind. Unfortunately, on YouTube, I've seen videos from people who I know they don't have a lot of experience in the industry and they're saying things about the layoffs as if they are facts. They're not. So no one knows what's happened. I think from my view, what I've seen like retrospectively happen with the layoffs is that it like two years ago or even three years ago, especially in 2021, companies went on a hiring spree. They thought the world was going to end in 2020 and it didn't. And we're like, all right, let's hire everybody. So I think they overhired. So companies even like Google and Facebook and all of these companies, they just went on a massive hiring spree. If they needed one person, they hired five just in case. So they did that. I think that was a mistake and it has proven to be a mistake. So the kind of correction, quote unquote, is happening. So I think one of the reasons why this is happening is that there has been overhiring. I've seen it. Companies have overhired. They had to let go some people because they were just sitting on the bench doing nothing. No one wants to admit that. The other thing that I observed as well is even the organization I worked for did a layoff. With the mass layoff, when the organization does a layoff, they don't tell you what the job titles of the people who were laid off are. So we don't really know if they were IT people, if they were cybersecurity people, if they were programmers, we don't know, right? So from what I've seen, a lot of the layoffs happened with sales people, account managers, HR people and culture, marketing. Now, there has been cybersecurity people and there has been IT people, but also we need to put that in perspective. Just because an organization laid off 200 people doesn't mean the 200 people were cybersecurity professionals. Chances are, we don't know what they did, but if we need to guess, maybe some of them were cyber, but not the majority. At least that's my anecdotal reading of the issue. Now, as layoffs or the way we need to deal with layoffs as individuals, first off, it doesn't concern us in the sense that, yes, it's unfortunate. Someone got laid off. All of that thing is bad. I wish them the best. But as an individual, all you need is one job. <laughs> so you don't need 500 jobs, right? You don't need to... To be, none of us can do more than one job at a time. So we really need one job. So if you're starting out in cybersecurity, think that your target is to land that one job. Or if you're working in the field, you need to land that one job. Now, is it going to affect you that there are more people in the market? Absolutely. But kind of that's always been the case. Like there's always been lots of people in the market, people with more experience than you, people with less experience than you. I think competition has always been there. I think the roots of the fear is that I'm going to start my career in cybersecurity, but I also don't want anyone else to do it. I just want it to be me and I want 500 job openings and I want to qualify for all of them. And I want to just pick and choose with like the, the real world doesn't work that way. Um, so I think that there is a, like there is multifacets to this issue. Two quick points. Sorry, before I end this walk to him. If someone like, let's say if I was laid off, right? And I have yeah. of experience, I will not be competing with the same jobs that someone who's starting out in their career is, is targeted. So my target job is different than someone who's new. Right. So if you're trying to land your first cybersecurity job, you are not competing with someone with 10 years of experience. They're going for a different job. The hiring manager is not going to hire that person for a junior job. Right. So 
chances are your entry level job, the competition hasn't really increased if you think about it. Yeah. Um, now the final one is AI. AI. People make a lot of stuff about AI, AI this, AI that. I think AI will continue to progress in a really fast pace. And yes, it will influence not just cybersecurity, but every field. It's, it's, it's coming, it's happening. Chances are it will improve a lot of the job. There is nothing we can do to quote unquote prepare and not be on top of AI. Yeah, you can learn how to use chat GPT and whatever, and it's, it's really straightforward to do that. But other than that, you just need to continue, like your journey doesn't change. You need to continue to study and learn and improve your chances and see what happens. The changes that AI will bring to the world is not specific to your job or my job. It's, it's going to be worldwide. It's going to affect the way the society works and there will be you know, backlash and people will need to retrain. It, it's fine. This is what happened when the internet was introduced. It's what happened when electricity was introduced. Like these changes happen and we just need to deal with them collectively. But as far as my journey, if I'm studying, if I want to try to work in GRC, if I want to work in ethical hacking, I still need to finish my work and study instead of saying, nah, the world is crashing, whatever. I don't want to study. It's too Hard, you know, <laughs> and yeah, stop. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. It's it's interesting views, and you know what? It seems like you take it from a very common sense perspective and very realistic perspective. And I think it's very valid, like everything you've just said. I think the overall message is just kind of be optimistic. Don't give up. Don't let things pull you down or make you feel like the whole world's coming to an end. All these layoffs are happening. The tech sector is failing. You know, it's still alive and well. And it's just a readjustment of companies that were bloated in a way. And now they're just cutting extra inefficiencies out and just trying to strip back and be more efficient. But if you focus on just being the best you can be, that's kind of the most important thing. So yeah, that's very, it's very the good only thing you have. It's the only thing you have control over anyway. And if you want to take comfort in like two things is that first off, this happened before, happened so many times, people forget. It's not the first time. It will continue to happen. The second is, let's say it's not the end of the world. And either way, let's say it's the end of the world. Like either way, there's nothing you can do about it. So it may as well just, you know, do the best you can and just carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. In terms of AI and cybersecurity, I know a lot of cybersecurity professionals use AI to kind of make them more efficient, maybe help them write emails, documents, review bits. Some people might help, you know, with code or kind of to review things that they might have written. Where do you see AI kind of fitting into cybersecurity? What's the impact from your perspective? Yeah, and look, I, I think the impact will be big. It's probably not what people are think. I mean, it could be, but my view is it will be big. I think first issue is we're seeing it already is the bad guys are faster in adopting new technology than the good guys. So hackers, hacking groups, they're already using AI. It's been leveraged, it's been used, we've seen it in the wild. So I think this is tick number one is that attackers and hackers will be a lot faster, a lot more efficient which they usually are. So on the bad side, there are already increasing in cyber attacks because of AI. They just got them more efficient. You'll find that the business world, or quote unquote, the good guys, things are a lot slower. So to get something down the line for a company, it really takes months of a project and you need to please everyone in the food chain. And it's it's a whole it's a whole ordeal. Yeah. So yeah, you, you'll find that bad guys will use AI a lot faster than good guys. So if you're worried that AI will steal your job, chances are the hackers are using it a lot faster than your company will. I think this is one. And, you know, something from our conversation earlier is, I'll, again, I'll meet with, you know, CEOs and like, I want to leverage AI for my cybersecurity. I'm like, oh, well, your password policy is still bad. Like you, you still haven't enabled it to factor <laughs> authentic. Like they, they want to do the latest and greatest, but you know, their house is not in order. So back to the fundamentals of a good cybersecurity program is get your house in order first before you try to quote unquote optimize and do efficiencies because you're, you're, you're not doing the bare minimum. You still have Windows 2003 servers in your environment that needs to be migrated. Like this is the real world that we live in. AI is great. You know, all these fancy tools are great, but the things that we need to do as cybersecurity professionals, those tend to not change especially not change rapidly. Now, as a cyber professional, you, you can, I mean, you can leverage AI if, if you do lots of fraud, you can leverage it. But the issue is you need to have enough experience to do Q&A. You need to understand how to do quality checks on what the AI is saying. If you don't understand the topic, AI is really good at writing something that looks correct, but it's not correct. So it will give you an answer. It'll give you a broad recommendation that sounds clever, sound that it could be correct, but then you'll say, oh, hold on, this is not right. And it missed five other important things. So again, for someone with experience who knows what they're doing, they may be able to make their job 
faster, I guess. Uh, but if someone's starting new, they're not sure and they're using an AI, this is a recipe for disaster. At least that's where we are now. Like, like again, AI will improve in the next two or three years. If we're going to go a little bit deep, technical, the LLM model of the current AI does have a lot of limitations. So it will always be limited to the things that have access to those learning modules, right? So I don't think we are at the stage of Skynet yet. We're not at the stage where AI is, is an, you know, it could happen, but not with the current LNM models. But, you know, again, like I said, no one can predict the future. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good response to be fair. Yeah. Focus on the fundamentals and try not to let AI maybe confuse you or throw you off. But if you can use it, try and make yourself more efficient. A very good response. I'll finish with this as well. In terms of cybersecurity, if you could start today or maybe Maybe if you just had a son or a little brother or somebody could recommend, you know, the top thing or top area to learn and specialize in, what would that be? I mean, I know you work in GRC, but would it be something else or would you point them towards cloud computing? We see cloud computing, cloud security architecture is really big right now. That's kind of just blown up since COVID and it's been steadily growing for the past decade or so anyway. For the future, it seems like cloud computing is certainly going to be a huge factor. You do see some other things. I mean, there's always like really good jobs like incident response, digital forensics, and a few other areas in GRC, of course. But yeah, what would be your most recommended thing for someone to do if they were to start learning today as a speciality? Yeah. Look, a really difficult question to answer, Saleh. It's hard for me because when I was starting out, I was obsessed with penetration testing. So no matter what, this was the thing I was going to do, the, regardless of what job I get. Even like my thinking was even, let's say I work as a taxi driver at the time and I study ethical hacking and I do it as a hobby. I was fine with that. So my concerns were not more to get a job was to, I want to learn this because I want to learn this. I, I was interested in the skill. And I think a lot of individuals who are drawn to cybersecurity, they're passionate about a certain thing in it. So there's no talking them uh, out of it. So if someone wants to learn penetration testing, put your head down, spin six months got a roadmap for you in my YouTube channel follow it to the T promise you you will you will be an ethical hacker or a digital forensic or whichever it is that you want I think like have some sort of interest in something and follow it through now I think where problems happen is people tend to think that a cybersecurity specialization is a life sentence if I started something if I started ethical hacking this is it I need to be doing it for the rest of my life or if I change specialty, then everything you learned was a waste of, it's not, it's not a waste of time, right? So if you learn a topic and you decide to change your mind or you want to do something else, all the knowledge that you gained will be transferable. It will be skills that will stay with you forever. So I do GRC now, but my pen testing and my digital forensic skills still come in handy. You have this more broad, holistic understanding of things, right? So I think back to your original question, start with something that you think you're interested in. Go for it. Go deep in it. Spend six, eight months in it. Don't spend just one week or, or one month. Give yourself some time really go deep do intermediate level certifications do labs really get a taste of it and see how you go now cloud like you said is something that is here to stay and again if someone comes to me and tells me i'm not sure what to do I'm like start with cloud it's a safe bet because even if you don't get a job in cloud security you might get a job as a cloud support engineer or a system admin etc cetera, etc cetera. so those skills are really valuable so cloud is definitely something that you will need to understand even let's say as a grc professional all data now most of data lives in the cloud so you need a broad understanding of cloud and things are easy now to understand like if you i've got a roadmap at cloud security where i you know tell you to learn microsoft azure etc cetera, etc cetera. but even once you learn that the same skill are transferable to aws or google cloud so learn it once and it stays with you as far as architecture because you mentioned architecture in my view architecture is not meant to be a beginner quote-unquote specialization architecture is something again titles in cyber security are messy someone might have the title of architect but they're really an analyst and someone could be an analyst they're doing a manager job so titles are misleading but architecture at its core it's meant to be this design job where you design solutions or you do this quote-unquote high level so i don't believe it should be a skill that someone starts off with it's something you progress into now you can do a cloud architecture aws certificate for example that doesn't mean you are an architect it means you've got some of the skills that are needed for design but broadly speaking when i do an architecture engagement as part of consulting usually i I look at a lot of things holistically and 
we give them a solution at that level. I think it's something to aspire to, something to progress into that you can do. But yeah, back to your question. Pick something that you think you will enjoy, spend six to eight months in it, and then see where it takes you. Yeah, yeah. That's some really good advice. Really appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's funny when you mentioned the hackers because I think a lot of people, that's how they got into cybersecurity. Especially for me, I just wanted to be a hacker. You just download Kali Linux, start running NMAC. You feel like you're the you're on top of the world, Mr. Robot. And then, yeah, you just get inspired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very common story I hear for people getting into cybersecurity and even for new people who want to do stuff before I recommend any certifications I always say like go and try hack me go on download Kali Linux play around fall in love with it and then you can kind of sit through some of the more boring study afterwards but yeah no, great advice and yeah the architecture cloud architecture roles are quite senior but cloud computing is definitely a safe bet but again you're only if you're interested so yeah i really appreciate the advice i think you've dropped some great gems i'll link your channel in the description and your grc mastery course as well and yeah follow albert if you don't already unix guy he's an amazing guy and he's got so many great videos so if you want full roadmaps check it out thank you for coming on honestly it's been an honor I've followed you since early days of me trying to get into cybersecurity and speaking to you now. It's kind of like a full circle moment. So I appreciate you coming on. So much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure, Salah. Thank you. Like, comment, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.